Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in today to AllTheGlory.net. We have a wonderful testimony coming to you today from Pam Morgan. We are really excited about this woman of God and what God has done in her life. Stay tuned. I just want to say, first off, Thank you so much for sharing with us here at AllTheGlory.net. We really appreciate you being here and sharing something so precious with us. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Hope. It is an honor for me to be be a part of this. Well, thank you. And again, like I was sharing earlier with you off um, record, I wanted to put out there why we are doing this. And again, I said when I went over to my uh, European tour, there were a lot of people that I met who wanted to know why we give God the glory, why we believe, why we sing the Gospels, and, um, and things like that. And so this is just my attempt to answer that question on a global uh, exchange because, like I said, so many people don't really know why we give God the glory. And so if we can just take one individual testimony at a time and put that out there and let people see what they're going through, and even with me doing this particular thing, I have been so inspired by the testimonies of of other people, and it has inspired me in a moment that I may feel down. So this is just not for unbelievers, but this is for believers alike. And so I have had the opportunity to read your testimony, and um, Mm -hmm. it is absolutely awesome. And so, um, Pam, I would like for you to kind of give paint the picture for us of what life was like before this encounter. Well, I was a believer already. I, I grew up in a Christian home. And uh, my husband and I had been married oh, for about 10 years, almost 10 years. And we were in the ministry. We were, uh, my husband is a songwriter and um, singer, and I, I sing as well. And so we had a, the Lord had called us into a music ministry, which basically was just to share uh, the gospel in, um, in a new and fresh way through our lives, what, what God was doing in our lives through filled music. So he basically, um, he he opened the door for us to travel uh, countrywide, and, and that's pretty much what we were doing. We were traveling between actually a morning and an evening concert on a Sunday afternoon. Okay. So mm-hmm. now, can you take us to the day of? Yes. Um, we It was a extremely busy weekend for us. I had, um, I had just quit my corporate job um, about three months before. Um, up until that point in our ministry, I had Phil was full-time in the ministry, and I had joined him um, just, just part-time, pretty much on the weekends. And, um, and we had two young daughters. We had um, a five-year-old, Kayla, and um, almost a two-year-old, Alicia. And we had a busy weekend that weekend. We were um, in a uh, a small town not too far from where we live, doing a, an all-day festival on Saturday. And it went longer than we expected, and so it was it was late that night when we all crawled into bed. And, of course, it was an early morning on Sunday morning. We had a morning uh, concert at a church about two hours down the road. And so uh, we all piled into our van and, and headed down um, to this church. And actually, it was, that was pastored by some very good friends of ours. And so we we made it there safely and had a wonderful time that morning and actually had um, lunch and some fellowship time with our friends in the afternoon before we had to head out to our evening concert uh, in southern Missouri. And so okay. as we um, we were exhausted by that point. Sounds and, like know, a full are, day. <laughs> yes, and our tummies were full. And, you know, Sunday afternoons are just kind of the time when everybody wants to kick back and relax and climb into their easy chair and take a nap. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, but unfortunately for us, we had to, um, we had to to pile into the van. Now I made Phil drive because I told him I was, I was just too tired uh, to drive. Mm -hmm. I would have fallen asleep. And so, um, so he piled into the driver's seat and I headed into the back seat with my daughters. Um, My, I I strapped them both in to their seat belts. Of course, the youngest was in her car seat and then mm-hmm. I was sitting right behind her next to my oldest daughter 
and I buckled her in in, in the seatbelt. But in conversion vans, the seatbelts have a bad habit of falling through the seat. And I was I was too tired and lazy <laughs> to pull it through. So I just strapped my daughter in, and I thought, you know, I'll just be back here with her for just a few minutes, and then I'll head up front and strap in with my husband in the front seat. And um, just quickly, as soon as the car started and the air conditioner hit me, <laughs> it was a hot summer day on, on June 4th of the year 2000. And um, so I was immediately asleep and fell oh, into a okay. deep sleep. And then we headed on down the road. And my husband was trying so hard to keep it quiet in the van because we were all mm-hmm. sleeping. And um, and then, unfortunately, he fell asleep at the wheel just just so briefly. And when he opened his eyes, mm. he was facing a guardrail. And so the van, um, the driver's side front tire went up on that guardrail. And when it slammed back down on the ground, it, the the force was enough to pull us over on the driver's side. And so, and it, mm. now we have to keep in mind that all this time our cruise control was set at 70 miles an hour. So oh, we wow. were, um, yeah. So at that speed, our van crashed and not belted in in the back seat. My body shot like a bullet through the rear window of our van and hit the pavement, hit the highway oh. at 70 miles an hour. I skidded and tumbled across the highway and slammed into the concrete barrier over the bridge where we landed. And, um, you can imagine, I was called in as a fatality. Amazingly, though, oh the, the Lord showed us from the very beginning that he was right there in control of the situation. Four cars followed us that Sunday afternoon, and the first car directly behind us who saw this whole thing happen held a Christian mm-hmm. couple who immediately stopped and jumped out to wow. help. The young man ran to the van to get Phil and the girls out. And um, they were not seriously injured. The girls were not injured at all. Phil had just broken his collarbone from the seatbelt. Oh, my God. Um, yes, praise God for that. And the young woman, yeah. she she ran directly to my side. She could see that I wasn't breathing when she reached me. Mm-hmm. But um, when she saw the severity of my injuries, it stopped her cold in her tracks. The left side of my face was torn off down to the bone. Um, she said there were she saw pieces of my scalp on the highway. There were, my left arm was nearly torn off, and I was covered from head to toe in what they call road rash. So I was a mess. But she knew Mm. that probably I had sustained some sort of, whether it was a head injury, um, neck injury, anything like that. She she knew enough not to try to move me, which she would have had to have done in order to administer CPR. So she... What I love is that anyone could have been in that car, but these people were believers. And as a believer, this young woman knew yes. that CPR was not her only option. And so she do- dropped to mm. her knees and she prayed. And halfway through her prayer, oh, I started to cough and cry and breathe on my own. And by the time she said amen, car number two, remember I said there were four cars following us, mm-hmm. car number two had stopped. And another young woman ran across the road who was a nurse. And right on her heels, cars three and four held a respiratory therapist and an anesthesiologist, doctor. Wow. Look at that. God had placed, yes, he had placed a very specific medical team around me to meet my very specific needs to save my life. And, you know, it's just amazing what happened from there. Of course, um, as soon as the the paramedics got there, they took over and... um, their testimony, they say that it was um, just a, a textbook case. I responded exactly the way that I should have um, to everything mm-hmm. that that they ascertained was the problem on the scene. Um, but that still, they did not. They didn't give me but maybe a two percent chance of making it by helicopter to the hospital in Kansas City. So, but by God's grace, wow. I did. Of course, it was touch and go for the first 24 to 48 hours. And then once I yes. stabilized, the doctor came out and shared the news with my husband that um, the damage had been done. My neck was broken. Actually, four vertebrae in my neck were crushed. Two of them were completely dislocated. Um, on, this, on the MRI, you could trace my spinal cord. It, made, um, it was in an S shape and made two 90-degree turns. And it appeared to be pinched off in two areas. And so he said there was absolutely no way that I would ever walk or move anything ever again. Uh, life as I knew it was over. Wow. 
So let me and ask that's you. Quite, so sure. what were you what were you thinking when you were laying there in the hospital? Where did you feel God was during this process? Did you feel he was near, far? Were you scared? I was terrified. I was terrified. But you have to keep in mind, too, that um, I don't remember a whole lot of the first two weeks of the accident. Okay. But okay. when I when I first woke up and um, was lucid, had my first lucid moments there in the ICU, Phil was right there next to me. And I just felt like I was dreaming Amen. the whole time. I didn't have any fear um, at the wreck. I didn't, although I don't remember, I have just uh, flashes of mm-hmm. memory from here that just seemed like they were from a bad dream, but there was yeah. no trauma involved in it. There was no, um, there was no fear at that point for me. Um, my first moment of fear was when I woke up, but well, when I woke up in, in the uh, uh, ICU, as I said, and I saw Phil had a sling on his shoulder. And then I realized that this was not a bad dream, but something terrible yeah. had happened. And my fear was all about, not about me, but my fear was all about I, I did not see my children and I knew that they were with yeah. me in that car. And yeah. immediately, as soon as I, you know, asked where the girls were, he said, don't worry, they're safe at home with Grandma. They're fine. And so from then on, I was like, okay, whatever what a relief. else. <laughs> yeah, whatever else is going on, I, this is okay. I can handle it. But um, wow. But still, it was... It was terrifying when they said, but my husband was amazing. He he truly was the rock in our situation. Um, yeah. He never once fell apart. He he stood strong on um, the hope of what God can do all the way through this. And he immediately, when he got the news about my quadriplegia and my spinal cord injury, he um, he immediately sent the word out on our email newsletter. And People forwarded that email like you would not believe. We received mm-hmm. responses back from all over the world, Guam, Poland, um, coast to coast in, in the United States, that people were, were praying wow. for my complete healing. Um, of course, the doctors gave us about a 72-hour um, window that if I, if I was going to receive any kind of movement back, it would be in that time frame. And when those mm-hmm. 72 hours passed, I was crushed. But um, oh. after that, we just kept praying, and people kept praying for me. And three weeks later, I moved um, just ever so slightly my left big toe. And um, that oh, was wow. a, a surprise for me. Mm-hmm, and at the time, mm-hmm. at the time, I was I was clinging to um, to God's word with Phil's help that um, that I was going to walk out of there. I just could not believe that and you know the nurses the the medical profession would have said that it was natural response that it was a denial response right you know Mm -hmm. and and maybe partially that it was but there was a piece there was a piece that I had that surpassed all understanding and that's what Philippians chapter 4 talks about um yes that yes that that when we pray and when we present our request to God and pour out our hearts and our souls to him, that that we will be guarded by a peace that yes. surpasses our understanding. Our hearts and minds yes, will be guarded will. in Christ Jesus. And so that's exactly what I felt. And I just had a confidence. There was a confidence that I could well, I'm not I'm sure explain. that it helped that Phil um, has, has put his faith into action. And, yes. and let me ask you, how important is this in the process when um, you have others around you who believe? How important is that? Is, is which part? How important is Where what? you have people around you who believe. Oh. oh, absolutely. It was so crucial. In fact, my therapists say that um, I had I had the perfect support system um, to, to help me through, regardless of what the outcome would have been, whether I would have been healed or not healed. Mm-hmm. Um, I had the perfect support system in place, and I did. Um, my, my family, you know, are all believers, although... It, let me tell you, when something like this happens, it really pulls your family together. And um, Amen. Um, and, and friends and family, it, it just, I received an outpouring of support. In fact, when um, when Phil would come in, to see, he 
took 24-hour shifts with me with my mother, and he would read mm-hmm. the cards and letters, and we had trash bags full of cards and letters from people. Wow. Um, expressing their prayers well, that is and amazing. their support. Yeah. That is amazing. So, now, I did read one section um, mm-hmm. where you said you wondered why God was cutting you off, and you quoted John fifteen two. He cuts every branch in me that bears no fruit. What did, yes. what did this mean to you? This was um, – when all of this came to light for me was after I went home. I was away from home for about three months uh, in the hospital and as an inpatient in therapy. And, of course, I continued outpatient therapy for months and months after that. But about, I would say, the accident happened at the beginning of June, and this was somewhere around um, maybe mid to late October. And we mm-hmm. were home, and it was a struggle just to learn how to survive and get through day by day. Because life was completely different. My house was not handicapped accessible. Yeah. I still had the mm-hmm. wounds that needed uh, treated and all that kind of thing. It took about four hours mm-hmm. to get me up and get me ready to go in the morning. And so Phil wow. had turned on the radio, and uh, Chuck Swindoll was preaching that morning on his program, Insight for Living. And he was preaching out of John mm-hmm. 15. And at this point, okay. we were just kind of numb, you might say, um, just trying to make it through, and so we were we were still trusting in the Lord and and praying and um, confident that He was going to do something. But His timetable is not our timetable, and so it wasn't Amen. going as quickly as <laughs> I expected. True. I expected one of those one touch mm-hmm. complete healings, and that's not the, what mm-hmm. God had in store for me. So. Amen. At this time, um, when he turned on the radio and, and, and Chuck started to preach out of John 15, and and uh, the passage that talks about uh, everyone who does not bear fruit, we are basically, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And every branch in me that produces no fruit, I will cut off. But every branch yeah. that does produce fruit, I will prune so that they will be even more fruitful. Well, the two words that yeah. jumped out to me were cut off because that's exactly how I felt. I did not understand why he would just, right. when our ministry was thriving, it was growing, we were seeing people touched and um, saved. Wow. I, I did not understand right. why the Lord would just, you know, pluck us out of that situation. So a cutoff was exactly the way that we felt, and it was confusing to us. And I, honestly, I felt hurt, and I felt a little lonely uh, because nobody really understood mm-hmm. how it felt to be me. And I, I could not understand. Right. I, I did not even know. I wasn't confident that the Lord even understood what it was like to be me, even though Scripture promises right. that he does. So anyway, at that time, right. but then Chuck continued, and he said that those of, of us who bear fruit – he will prune so that they will be even more fruitful. And the pruning shears of our Lord yeah. hurt. And yes, they do. Oftentimes, when he started talking yes, about the do. vineyard, you know, when when um, when a vine keeper prunes his vineyard, he um, and if you see in the season of pruning, those those branches that those vines they seem like barren, bleeding stumps. And that's exactly the way that I felt. Yes, but I felt like a barren bleeding stump. I can understand. Stump. And just um, mm-hmm. long story short, um, I was diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis right in the midst of um, the same oh, thing, yeah. everything going wonderful and, you know, just doing everything God had called me to do. And mm-hmm. um, and then I found myself not able to use my arms and my legs and things like that. Yeah. And um, and when I was diagnosed, I went through it for four years before I was even diagnosed, and I felt the same exact way. Like, why now? Why is this, you know, being allowed to attack me to this degree after all mm-hmm. of the work? And so when I read um, your testimony and I saw that piece, I said, God, you know, it, it made me, it helped me to understand where you yeah. was in that place. Mm-hmm. Because that is not a, a easy place to be. You know, you think you're doing everything right and, and everything is coming together and God is smiling on you and then, bam, you know, right in the midst of it, it's like, I don't know what to do now right. but to lay here and let you work. Right. And that's exactly. a hard place. Yeah, so. And but, um, we, we, go ahead. 
I'm sorry. I was just going to say, and tell me, um, when things started to come around, you said you, you felt your toe and then now you're home. And mm-hmm. so and what was that process to get to back to where you are now? Well, it was, it was um, in retrospect, it's not a long period of time, but to me it seemed like an eternity. Every day seemed like Forever. an eternity <laughs> when I was given no hope from the medical profession. So we're really um, um, anyone else other than my family. So it was a, a situation of when I, by the time that I went home three months later, I was able to, to kick out my left leg so from the knee down. Okay, so basically okay. I had some, some quadricep movement in my left leg. Now, my right side was not responding whatsoever. Um, and that included my hands. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't hold anything with my hands. So I had a little bit of arm movement, but I did not have the upper body strength either to move myself around. So by mm-hmm. the time that I went home, I was still very, very dependent on other people to do everything for me. So it it was about, um, it was somewhere in the end of October, beginning of November, when my therapist came to me. And uh, after, of course, months of therapy, and, and she took me to the parallel bars, with, and she had a knee brace in her hand. And uh, that was when I took my first step at the parallel bars. And let me tell you, that was a shock. I did not, I did not see that coming. And wow. so that, that was the first time that anyone in the medical field gave me any indication that they believed that I would walk again, whether it right. was assisted or unassisted. And so, isn't that hard to, to believe and know that God is mm-hmm. going to pull you through, but at the same time, everything that is, I would say, earthly is saying, no, this is right. not going to happen for you. And to fight against two two worlds, in a sense, mm-hmm. has to be, exactly. it's, it's just crazy. Right. Right. It was just so much harder than I expected it to be. Um, mm-hmm. As I said before, I expected that one touch healing and, and that I would wake up one morning and all my strength would return. And that's not at all what happened. So it was about four four going on five months when I took my first step. And then um, by Christmas, I was able to walk across the floor with a walker. That was my Christmas gift to my family. Um, mm. And then... Um, right after the first of the year, in fact, my New Year's resolution was if I could walk with a walker, I was going to walk unassisted by the end of the year. And uh, wow, shortly that after that, yeah, well, shortly after that, my therapist came to me and, uh, and during one of our therapy sessions, and she just held out her hand. She didn't have the walker or anything with her. She just held out her hand. She said, take my hand, let's go. And uh, <laughs> that was pretty amazing. Mm. And so... But it was very slow after that. And honestly, mm-hmm. I have to admit to you that um, um, it, it still was not what I expected. My my strength that I wanted to return, I'm still waiting on the complete healing. So although I yeah. am walking today and I'm much stronger than I, um, than I was, um, I'm not completely healed, if you if you know what I'm saying. I am walking, and no, that I is do. an amazing I miracle. I truly do. I truly so, do understand. I'm sorry. That is one of the things that um, when you deal with issues, uh, especially health issues, I've mm-hmm. always been, ever since I've been diagnosed, I've been out here talking to people in nursing homes and, and different mm-hmm. things like that about healing. And mm-hmm. and I think it is most people expect that one-touch type of healing. But I right. always tell people that it is all about how we handle the process. Exactly. And a lot, like I knew on the day that I was diagnosed that it would not be gone overnight. Mm-hmm. And the people that I've been able to bless in the right here in the situation that I'm in is unreal. And I do mm-hmm. believe that if I would have had a one-touch healing, I would not mm-hmm. have been able to touch as many people as I am now. Exactly. And so I, I kind of embrace where God has me, because I know yes. that his purpose is greater than what I want to feel like. Right, right. Does, does and that you make know sense? That, that it makes perfect sense, because I agree with you. And and but first and foremost, what he has to do in you is what he did in me. And I know that he's out, he is doing that in you. Um, it's evident in, in what you're doing, Hope. But um, And I love that your name is Hope. <laughs> um <laughs> 
I do because God is has showing His hope through you, and that's that's awesome. Aww, anyway, but um, but the uh, the John fifteen when it talks about that that He will um, He will prune to make you even more fruitful. Well, the fruit that He's talking about there is not the fruit of evangelism, and we often think I grew up thinking that that's what He was talking about. Now, evangelism and um, and bearing fruit of of bringing more believers into the kingdom sure is an, is a, an end result. But the fruit that he's talking about bearing there is is the fruit of the Spirit that Galatians chapter 5 talks about, which is Amen. love, joy, peace, yeah. patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Yeah. And all of those things have to happen in us first. Mm-hmm. 